did this morning with what he's bringing up. Oh, let's bring me down like a lot. Thank you. And um, what I want to do is I want to talk about the most aggressive tool that I can give you to help you do more deals. How many of you want to grow your portfolio faster? <coughs> I'm just starting to notice that there's actually quite a bit of green out here, but some of you are missing green. Check out this cool tattoo my wife and my kids gave me this morning. Isn't that great? I'm, I'm, un, I'm unpinchable. <laughs> there you go. You, on the other hand, you could do for some pinching. <laughs> the green pen is totally not, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. I'm sorry. The, oh my gosh, there's like half of you that's the green pen, really? <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Lisa, Lisa got visited by some leprechauns that triggered a lot of her traps, but she didn't capture any. So she's my, she is 10 and determined. My wife and I are looking at each other like, what's she playing at? There's, there's something going on here. So what I want to do is I want to give you the most aggressive tool that I can to help you do more deals. Because the reality is today and tomorrow, um, we're going to be getting really concrete on next steps and exactly how you do it and you know, get your pens out and take notes on steps one and two and three. And is there a place for that type of training? Is that important? Yeah, absolutely. But it does not matter if you are not leveraging your own intention in creating what you want. Because th there's a saying out there that I think we've all heard, where there's a will, there's a... Where there's a will, there's a way. And you know what? I find so often that when I meet people, they're like, oh man, I, I wish I was going faster. I love real estate so much. I wish I could do more deals. The reality is if you're not doing more deals, all you've done is found your comfortable space where you're willing to believe more in your excuses than actually putting out an intention that gets a deal done. Here's one thing I know for a fact. If your life was on the line, you could do a deal inside of 30 days. How many of you believe that? Now, why is that? Why is that in the next 30 days, you could all have a deal done and you wouldn't be panicking over, what are the next steps? What do I got to do? I mean, serious, if your life was on the line, why would it change your ability to actually get a deal done in the next 30 days? What's different about the scenario? There's an urgency. You're motivated, right? Like, I hope you value your own life more than whatever it takes to get a deal done, right? Because there are deals that you can do that require no money, $5,000 or $40,000. But we all know that our lives are worth more than 40 grand, right? And certainly worth more than five grand. And if you can do a deal for a few thousand dollars, no comparison. So why isn't it then that we're not doing a deal every month? We don't have the motivation. I mean, I'm going to act, I'm going to tell you that knowledge, I'm going to put it in the excuse bucket, lack of motivation. I'm going to put it in the excuse bucket. And by the way, whatever we put in the bucket, here's the important thing for you to know who's right. You'll, you will always be right. So whatever you put in the bucket, it's all about you being what? So let's talk about why we're not doing deals. One is motivation. Another one is I don't have the knowledge. And by the way, if you have a belief, I don't have the knowledge, what could you find yourself doing for decades? Acquiring what? Uh, acquiring knowledge. But even in the receiving of knowledge, is it still possible to then continue perpetrating the idea, I don't have enough knowledge? Yeah. I, I see so many people. And man, their lexicon, I mean, they're filling their brain with so much garbage. I mean, I'm intentionally purging information out of my head that I'm so sick and tired of trying to keep track of. Like in my life, I don't do bills. I don't remember numbers. I don't remember birthdays. I use electronics for that and I use my wife for that. It's like there are things that she agrees to do and things that I agree to do. And there's, there's certain information I don't want in my head. I write one check a month, just enough to barely remember how to write them when the next time comes around and it's for the guy that does my hair. This is because he comes to my house and it's the easiest way to take care of it. There's just things that I don't want to keep in my head. So knowledge, what else? What are other reasons for not doing a deal a month? All right, so it's kind of like, how many of you find that doing your first deal is actually really exciting? If you haven't been there yet, how many of you think your fifth deal would be exciting? How many of you think your 10th deal would be exciting? Yeah, but at some point we get comfortable, okay? 
So being comfortable at some point, we just hit a barometer where it's like, well, if my life were on the line, I would do it. But since it's not, I won't. But I sure as heck will keep complaining that I want more of it. What else? What other things do we, what else can we put in this bucket for reasons why we're not doing a deal a month? Family obligations. Our, our nine to five jobs. Okay, so we have commitment problems and priority problems, right? Where we'll say things like, well, I can take three days and come to this training and I will work on taking my next step, but I'm actually not going to follow through with doing another deal because family obligations, nine to five. Man, I, I got a pretty packed schedule. How many people do you know have the, the busy-itis? It's just, that's their, that's their reason, right? Too busy for their own success, got it? What other reasons why we're not doing a deal a month? Well, I think we have to ask ourselves, do we really have the desire? I, I mean, I heard the saying, be careful what you want because that's what you'll get. Yeah, and yet we're in conflict because what we'll do is we will actually dedicate some of our time to stepping into what we want, but because we're not fully committed, we actually don't get the what? We don't actually get the benefit that we want. Yeah, absolutely. You, one of the things you mentioned was, Debbie? Money. money. Yeah, how many of you use money? Well, if I had more money, duh, I'd do more deals. Yeah. But put your hands up. Yeah, I just want to call bull crap on it. I bet if I had the money sitting in your bank account, you may find still a reason to drag your feet. If, are any of you willing to be honest enough to know that if there was 100 grand in the bank, you still might find the next best reason to stay in where you're at? How many of you think that? So I could take this hour and I could talk about this is how you do real estate and these are all the steps. But why, if you're not going to act anyway? Do you want to know why people don't take action? This is something I really loved about Jim Rohn. Everyone know who Jim Rohn is? Jim Rohn had this saying that just mesmerized me when I heard it from his lips. He says, some will, some won't. It's the magic and it's the great mystery. The magic is that some will. The mystery is that some won't. I'm going to amend that statement. The mystery is that most won't. And the magic is that a few will. And yet, the few and the most, do you know what separates them? Almost nothing. They're not more special and they're not more talented and they're not more gifted people. This is what I have found to be true, and this is what I want to take the hour talking about. I want to talk about our core programming on how we perceive the world. Because if you can learn how to alter your perception, you will start seeing different things. How many of you, um, how many of you uh, have ever dreamt of having a certain car and then bought that car? How many of you ever had that experience? Okay, what car did you want to have? Which is a? It's a, it's a Toyota Highlander. A Toyota Highlander is a beautiful car, right? Um, let me ask you, from the time that you knew you wanted a Toyota Highlander, there was a moment where you basically said, before you had it, I want that. There was a moment. Like, I remember the first time I saw a Dodge Viper when I was 15 years old. It was blue with white racing stripes pulled up right next to me. And I just started salivating and drooling. <laughs> Combine that with some powerful 15-year-old teen hormones. And I just said, I got to have this, right? And from that moment forward, guess what I would see? If, if even my periphery could pick it up, what would I notice of all the cars I could focus on? What would I see? I would see Dodge Vipers. I remember a few years ago, I flew to Phoenix to pick up my Dodge Viper. Had the money, had everything going for me. There it was in the showroom. I said, this is it. This is the car that I want. I can't believe it. This is so amazing because who doesn't want that 15-year-old you know, dream to come true or however long it is. And uh, I remember opening the door and thinking to myself, huh, oh, looks a little tight. <laughs> and I sat in it but I could not. I'm 6'4". I don't think 5'10 could sit comfortably in that car. What happened to my dream in that next moment? It changed really fast. I don't want to Dodge Viper. Guess what doesn't come into my perception anymore? Guess what I'm not seeing anymore? We, uh, take this in for just a minute. They say, I don't know how they measure this crap, but it's fascinating and it's impressive. 
<laughs> they say that uh, uh, we have the ability optically to take in every second four billion bits of information. Now, I don't know what that means, but I think of the TVs today when they talk about like the number of pixels. And the new thing in TVs, for those of you that like electronics, the TVs now, you can shoot video and do things in what's called 4K. The, the, ba the old thing was, that was the impressive was 1080p. And basically it translates into how many little dots you have on your screen and, and how much information you can pack in there. 4K has four times as many pixels. And if you watch a 4K TV, sometimes the image looks so real, it, it looks funny and weird. Has anyone ever found that, by the way? So I just bought two of these TVs and I'm still adjusting to, I think they did too good of a job on these electronics. It's kind of weird looking. It's too real. <laughs> When you, when you watch football, you are in that, you, you are in the stadium, right? All you need to do is like turn a fan on and blow something in your hair and yeah, totally, exactly. If we could take in four billion bits of information, any guess on how much we actually per second can process? 2,000. Four billion bits of information is what we soak in, but we can only interpret per second how much? Okay, someone help me out. Statistically, 2,000 is what percentage of 4 billion? It, it's like us walking out to a beach and picking up a couple grains of sand and saying, this is the beach. That's it. That is all we can process. So here's my question. If you can only take in 2,000 bits of information, what are you perceiving? No, but to you, it's everything. It may be tiny in relation, but the reality is you have to know, you're telling your mind of all the four billion bits of information, I can only pick out a couple grains, so I actually have to know what it is I'm asking to look for. If I fall in love with Dodge Viper, what am I gonna see? Dodge Viper, guess what's going to start taking up some RAM in my head? Dodge Viper. Question is, what are you perceiving? What are you looking for? And the question is, what do you want? Because here's the reality. Your beliefs, called a paradigm, all of them combined, they ultimately are what, what are gonna make up your entire perception. So by the way, as a child, how many of you um, ever felt unloved as a child? Did you ever have a moment where you felt unloved? Right. If you did, and if it was an emotional experience, and to a child, everything is emotional. Then there, a part of your perception carries with it an idea. I'm not lovable, and because that's in my perception, it's the Dodge Viper. For my world to make sense, what do I gotta see? I gotta see Dodge Vipers, I gotta see unlovability. So when I interact with human beings and strangers and those that I love, I'm just waiting to pounce on the opportunity where I can interpret everything they're putting at me, and what am I really searching for in my communication? I'm waiting for the moment that unlovable surfaces so that I can say, I am right, because I'm always gonna be right. Our perception, this is what I'd submit to you, is filled with some good stuff and some bad stuff. Some of our perceptions have been intentionally programmed for good. Like for example, what are some of the good things you see happening in your life on a regular basis? What are some good things you look for? Running water, so when you see running water, that's something you feel some gratitude for, right? Awesome, what else? Helpful people is something that, that Vaughn appreciates, so when he meets someone that's helpful, that, that's something that is meaningful to him. What else? Okay, close, close connection. You intentionally drive effort and energy into producing a certain type of connection so that you can feel a certain way and, and you put all sorts of effort and energy into this relationship so that you can produce certain fruits and you want it for you, it's important that you drive that connection piece. And you notice it, right? So we can actually look for good things, but what are some of the things, what are some of the undesirables that show up in your life? Illness. illness. How many of you think that you are powerful enough to manifest illness? I want to share with you exactly how it works. Like, I want to actually give you step concrete. 
A few years ago, I was running in the canyon with some friends, and this was a time when I was doing ultra marathons and marathons, and I was doing a lot of running. And uh, I was running with my brother and a running friend. Both of them are skinny sticks and they're sleek, and I had a belief in my head that big people can't run fast and skinny people can run fast and long endurance. And I developed this belief that, well, I can't be fast, but I can have good endurance. And so I would do these marathons, but don't clock me. I'll never stop, but it's never gonna be fast. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna chug and I'll finish my marathon like this and everyone will be, yay, Chris finished a marathon, how great. It's like, I'm not breaking any records, right? And I was out there running one of these days and I got four miles into our 10K run and my knees started hurting. And I thought, oof. There was a temptation that came up. There is a belief that I've heard from a number of other people that say, once you get bad knees, you, you're finished, you can't run, and you will always have bad knees. And so being aware of the training I've had, I said, oh, that's a fascinating temptation, but I don't think I'm ready to call it quits on my knees. So I said, hey guys, I'm done. I'm gonna turn around, run back, see you tomorrow. Next day, went out running at mile 4.2 again, my knees started hurting again. This time, the temptation came really strong. Chris, you, your knees, they're done. And I was sitting there in a moment of consciousness saying, man, this is a really big decision for me because if I actually say I got bad knees, then is it possible, if I put that into my perception for the rest of my life, what am I gonna look for? I'm gonna look for bad knees. And from some life experience I've had, I knew better. So I said, you know what? I'm absolutely unwilling to put that in my perception. I just, I grounded, I just asked, what do I need? And I just could feel my body saying, you need to just rest, you've been working hard. So I actually decided to take two weeks off of running. Two weeks later, I went running with my brother and my friend. Mile 4.2, felt nothing. 10K, things felt great. My knees have never hurt running again. The moment my body ever manifests an undesirable that I interpret as undesirable, I create space that says, that's okay. You get the space that you can feel that way this moment. But I am not going to harden that into a concrete principle that I'm going to start interpreting my life with. Because once I do, I could be doomed. My choices are either gonna create saving grace and happiness and joy and pleasure and wealth and connection, or it could do the opposite. And all the crap we have in our life is because we allow ourselves to make decisions that put ideas into our perception that produce undesirable results. And I've made this like a quest for my life. In fact, just two months ago, I started a whole new journey. Um, when I was in eighth grade, I was the second fastest boy running the mile. And I thought that was so cool because the year before, I think I ran my mile in like 12 minutes. And I think I was the slowest, one of the last to finish the race. And you know, I got my growth spurt and I lost some weight and uh, I had been doing a paper out so I grew, grew a little bit of muscle on my, on my legs. And that year when I ran, I ran a 545. I was, I, I was just so happy and impressed. And you know, you know what it's like in middle school. I mean, no one wants to go back there. But I was a hero that day like, whoa, my gosh, this was so, like, so amazing. And it was interesting because I made a decision about myself. The decision I made was I'll never be faster than this in my entire life. So while I was celebrating, I put something in my awareness. That's my top speed, that's my top gear. I'm 36 years old. Two months ago, I'm running next to a friend of mine and my friend says, hey, let's go run a, a six minute mile. And I thought, six, that's only 15 seconds more. And usually if I run distance, I'm running eight and a half to nine and a half minute miles. So. I guess I could try it. Well, I ran a seven minute mile. And I thought, well, if I ran a seven minute mile, why couldn't I run a 645? It's not 545, I know that's my top gear. Ran a 645, I ran a 630, and then I ran a six minute mile. I was so surprised that I said, you know what, I think I need to challenge. I'm within 15 seconds of eighth grade. I'm 36, this is eighth grade. You tell me that a 30 year old could like kick the trash out of his eighth grader-ness? So I, <laughs> I got excited about this, so I decided to intentionally alter my perception. The limiting belief was, if I'm big, I'm built for endurance and not for speed. speed. So it wasn't really serving me. So what I decided was, I go long distances and I am crazy fast. I'm amazingly fast. I can run a five minute mile. And you know what happened? 
I ran a 545, then I ran a 540, then I ran a 530, then I ran a 520, and then I ran a five minute mile. Scorched my lungs real good. I felt that one burning real heavy in there. This was maybe about a month ago. And I just decided, you know what? Why stop at five? What's, what's actually possible? I don't necessarily need to be better than, but I just, I'm curious, what is my potential? Last week on Monday, oh, actually, sorry, it was this week on Monday. It was four days ago. I ran a four minute and 30 second mile. <laughs> Fastest I've ever run. Yeah. I'm not going to the Olympics or anything, but the point is, is that that is how powerful our minds are. So they can drive our health. They do drive our relationships. Right now, think for just a moment. Every one of us in this room has a pattern with someone we love that some things get said, we get triggered, we go into a pattern, and we go into some negative low energy, and then we cope with food or hiding or being a doormat or yelling. Like, how many of you can identify with some pattern you have with a loved one where you spiral out of control emotionally, right? You wanna know the crazy thing? This is the crazy thing, that's not you. That's just some stupid decision that you made a long time ago that you put, it's the, it's the viper you put in your perception. And I waited like 20 years before I sat in a viper before I realized, oh my gosh, I can't actually drive a viper because my knees are where the steering wheel is supposed to be. So I dumped it. Do you know how to purge your perception of your problems? Do you know that you can? Your perception is something you have complete control over, but like Ken suggested, so much of it is subconsciously driven. Subconscious means blind spot. Subconscious means there's a lot going on under the hood that we're not aware of. Like how many of you are aware right now that your heart is beating or that you're breathing? You're not. You just do it, it's involuntary. You don't have to think to breathe. You don't have to think to make your heart pump blood. It's something that occurs. And the subconscious mind is built the exact same way. People come to me, and they used to come to me for real estate, and real estate has become such an easy, effortless, boring endeavor in my life. Like making money in real estate is just like, this manifest deals like crazy, because I don't have any room in my perception for a problem when it, when it relates to money and business. My beliefs are, there's all the money in the world, there's all the credit in the world, there's all the amazing deals in the world, and I have a team that will do it all for me. Boring, check, next race. Like, give me a challenge, give me something new. And don't get me wrong, I love the money that I make in real estate. Right now, I've been selling off a property or two every month and cashing in significant five-figure returns every month. And then I dump it into more real estate. Like, I'm having fun, but I minimize it to five minutes because I've automated it. How many of you would like to get there? That can't happen unless you alter your perception to make that possible. Does this make sense? Do you see the tie-in? Your perception is whose? So I want to invite you to do something right now. Y'all got pen and paper. I'm going to invite you just to get grounded for a second. And I'm going to invite you to make a list right now. I want to invite you to make a list of the things in your perception that show up that you don't like. What do you perceive that is undesirable to you? For those of you online, what are the undesirables that you perceive in your life? Make a list. I'm going to give you about 90 seconds, so I want you to race all the things that you can think of. What's undesirable that shows up in my relationships? What's undesirable in how I perceive myself? Where do I lack confidence? What do I perceive about my possibilities financially? What do I perceive about my health, my energy, my body? (laughs) 
45 more seconds. Five more seconds. All right. How many of you came up with at least five undesirables that you perceive? Anyone come up with more than that? Six? Seven? Seven? Fourteen. Fourteen? Anyone beat fourteen? Bruce got ten. Wow, good job. Fourteen. Okay. Why are these undesirables in your life? Why do you perceive them? Why are they there? How are they here? Were you born with them? Like, is it the, well, this is the way my life has to be? Because in this conversation, you want to know one of the reasons why conversations like this are uncomfortable? How, how many of you think this is a little bit of an uncomfortable conversation, honestly, right? It's introspection. How, like, is there anyone here that gets a little uncomfortable with introspection? Like looking at yourself? Yeah, we, we do. Part of the reason why it's uncomfortable is because in our childhood, we got programmed and now what we want to do is we are trained to do this thing called homeostasis. Everyone say homeostasis. homeostasis. That means keep the status quo. It means what? Keep the status quo. Okay. Don't it means don't change. And do you know why we're programmed to not like change? Because when something unexpected occurs in our life that is undesirable, here's the reality. I got my agency, but so do you. How many of you have ever had someone else use their own agency in a way that negatively impacted you? Yes, change was wrought upon you and you didn't ask for it. And in that moment, you determined that circumstances can come into your life that are greater than you and have power over you. And people can use their agency to disadvantage you. And as a result, we decide, oh my gosh, this world is kind of unsafe. I've got all these bozos walking around that at any moment could club me over the head. My neighbor says something I don't like. The person in church criticizes me for this or that, right? You know what I'm talking about. And as a result, we just want to do everything we can to like, okay, just, there's enough people moving my cheese and garbage and just don't, don't touch anything. Leave my stuff alone because people will come and pick things up and move them and, you know, they'll give you a wedgie. And so we just get ourselves in this really awesome, amazing stuck rut. And then what we do is we want more. How many of you want more in life? But it is in direct opposition to what? Stay, stay still. Don't move. Don't change. Just like every one of you is here because you want to buy more real estate. Yes or yes? yes. But that doesn't mean you're going to do a deal in the next 30 days because there's a part of you that is fighting to keep everything. So you want financial, who wants financial freedom? But you want to be stuck more. That's bipolar. <laughs> no, you don't medi Yeah, we're going to do some medicine today. Now, there's probably a couple of people either online or here that I have offended, like, don't joke, bipolar's real. Like, I know, you're all bipolar. So, friends, you cannot create a new result when part of you doesn't want to create it. I don't care if it's a New Year's resolution. I don't care if you say, this year I want to double my income. But having money is bad, subconsciously. Having money is evil, it could keep me out of heaven. Having, oh, rich people, oh, they got hygiene problems. Rich people stink and they're dirty and they're rotten. Okay, those two thoughts, one minus one equals no things, no new things. Nothing new comes into your life as long as you make room in your perception for these undesirables. With this information, what's, what's the question of the day now? How do we fix it? How do we purge and get rid of these undesirables? What else? What question do you have with this information? Oh, what, where would I be if I didn't have any of those undesirables? Oh my, 
gosh, what would happen in my life if I did not have these undesirables undermining me? In other words, where would I be if I stopped undermining me? How many of you would appreciate leveraging a little bit of time to figure out how to purge your perception? Is that useful? I want to share with you exactly how to do this. And I want you to know that I, I have an invitation. I have a free gift for every one of you that is here online in your homes and for those of you that are here. Um, we put on a three-day event called Limitless. Has, has any of you heard of this event, by the way? All right. Um, we have this next event coming up in Salt Lake City next week. It's a three-day event. And uh, we've got one in April the next month. That one will be in Provo at the Utah Valley Convention Center in downtown Provo. The purpose of, these th of this three-day event is to purge your perception of your undesirables. It is to help you eliminate the waste. It is to get rid of what is not working. And we do it through a technique called belief breakthrough. What's it called? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to demonstrate what this belief breakthrough is. Um, I'd love to actually take one of you here in the audience that is willing to create a moment of authenticity and is willing to be vulnerable because this is vulnerable stuff like introspection for some of us is not necessarily a, a party. It's a party for me. I, <laughs> what, what, listen, I, have fall, I am way too in love with the results that purging the perception produces. And so in a moment, I'm going to ask one of you to actually go through the process of purging something from your perception that is not useful for you. Uh, but before, they, before I do that, I want to share this new possibility with you. You can only perceive problems by choice. Perceiving problems is a choice. When you can no longer perceive problems, what happens? Whatever you're seeing includes the absence of problems. Remember, four billion bits of information and I only have 2,000 to interpret per second. And of the 2,000, it is impossible for me to interpret any of the 2,000 as a what? As a problem. So, there's two types of work that we do here. We do commission work and omission work. The commission work is, what have I done in my past? What poor choices have I made that are putting things in my perception that undermine everything that I want? And then, this is the beautiful thing. Do you know what happens when you stop perceiving problems? You actually get to program your perception for what you want. Instead of it being programmed for everything that you Can you see why I'm so passionate about this? Friends, I love our real estate company and I love the value that we create for people. I love the half a billion dollars worth of real estate that we have done with our clients these last few years now. And it is, a, it, it is super rewarding for me to know that we're creating value in the world. The value that I'm talking about now is priceless. Because you have one life and I'm talking about the quality of it. I'm talking about the quality of your life. Who determines the quality of your life? Who determines whether you're rich or poor? Who determines whether you struggle or it's easy? Who determines whether your life is fraught with, uh, with illness that overcomes you or you've got this amazing health that supports you? If what I'm saying is true and it is possible to be in the complete absence of problems, then what would your life be like if you could then put anything into your perception that would serve you? See, I live in a fairy tale land. I do. I live in this amazing fairy tale land somewhere in between what has manifested and what has not yet. But it is the same to me. The thing that I love most is manifesting. I believe that I'm here to create. I believe that this world is unfinished. There's this half-woven tapestry and we got seven billion people on the planet that are feverishly at work. And some of us are busy adding into the threads affliction and misery and suffering. And others are creating love and service and light and fulfillment and joy. <coughs> and this beautiful, this beautiful tapestry, we're all part of it. Question is, what are you weaving? 
what are you creating? Because you are always, you're never not creating. You're always creating, whether you're aware of it or not. You see, I'll, I'll tell you in my world, uh, this last week I had a chance to manifest a car that I was on a two-year waiting list for. It's, uh, it's the brand new BMW i8. And it, it looks like something out of some futuristic sci-fi something. B BMW basically, I fell in love with this two years ago when they said they were coming out with it because these German engineers and tree huggers all got together and said, let's take this concept of a hybrid electric green energy car and let's see if we can turn it into a sports car, a competitive sports car, a sports car that could compete with real other sports cars. And um, I just fell in love with the look and the beauty and the innovation and all of it. And uh, my number came up last week and I had a chance to purchase this. And I, you know, one of the things that one of my Indian friends taught me, he says, Chris, in my, in my country, wealth means that which rotates. I love spending money. I love rotating wealth. I love seeing it pass through hands. When I talk about this company with a little bit of pride doing half a billion dollars worth of business, I'm proud that we have a company that is circulating every year hundreds of millions of dollars through the economy because that's, a, that's creation that I value. That's, that's part of my stand and purpose in life. Did you park in here yesterday? Yes, I did. Did you park? Yes, then you did see it. If it was a funky-looking, futuristic vehicle with, 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 with they're, they're falcon doors that come up black, yeah. Um, in my life, you know, right now I'm kind of renovating my house because nine years ago I manifested a 10,000 square foot home on the golf course right outside the Provo Canyon. This year I'm manifesting for my company in event center because of all the events we're holding. And this year I'm also manifesting a cabin up at Sundance with the lot that I've picked out. And I'm also manifesting a billion dollar company. I'm also manifesting whenever possible, however possible, 10 out of 10 relationship with my wife. I'm also manifesting love, as much love as I can possibly mentor into my four little children that despite my best efforts must pass through the valley of the shadow of death where they will perceive their world with problems where dad's imperfect and we make mistakes. But I just get, fun, I just get to have fun watching it and loving it as they come up with all these ridiculous and erroneous interpretations of their experience. Some of them beautiful and just some of them is, you know, that makes us all crazy. Don't you ever make yourself a little crazy sometimes? <laughs> like some of your patterns. How about, how about some of you ever get crazy about other people in your life? Like, they drive you crazy. <laughs> so in my life, I love manifesting all these beautiful things that are being called into creation. And yet I'll also tell you there's a number of things that have already been built and occurred, but they still only exist where? They exist in my perception. Because once I plant the seed and I get married to it, and I'm fully committed to it, and I eradicate everything from the perception that would get in the way of it, what ends up happening is it becomes inevitable. And what I'm teaching you right now is what I call inevitability thinking. What's it called? Yeah. How many of you would like to know that eventually you're gonna get what you want? It, it needs to gestate, right? I can't make a baby in a day, it takes nine months, there's a process. Field mouse takes, I think, 14 days, and a cheetah takes, I think, 93, and an elephant takes two years. Your dreams, big or small, they, got, they need time to gestate. The question is, what do you have in your perception that is keeping it from coming? Well, purging this has, been, has become really one of the, probably one of the favorite parts of my life because it puts me in the driver's seat. I'm completely in control of everything that I can control. And here's what it also means. I also live in a world where I get, a, I get to meet a bunch of beautiful people that also have their perceptions and they'll also use their agency and sometimes they'll use it to my benefit. That happens a lot. Sometimes they use it in ways that others would perceive as ill-willed, as problematic. The reality is though, every one of us is greater than any circumstance we're ever gonna confront. That belief will serve you. That means that cancer, death of a loved one, none of it has power over you war, POW, camps, no matter how atrocious, rape, it doesn't matter how big the circumstance, you either believe that you are greater than your circumstance or that your circumstance is greater than you and you're at choice. My choice is to be greater than all of my circumstances. So, do I have a willing participant 
that would actually like to do a purge on their perception so that they can more powerfully call into creation that which they want. Would you come on up here, Debbie? Will you please give her a big round of applause? And uh, I think we got a microphone. I'm going to use that for the benefit of everybody else, Debbie. Besides, microphone helps me feel more comfortable. So I'm going to put it in your hands so that this is your comfort stick. Oh, yeah. I'm really comfortable here. <laughs> so it's nice to reconnect with you, by the way. I know. It's been Was, a while. Is Chris going to be showing up? Yes. Oh, you say hi to him for me if I don't I will. see him, okay? All right. So um, here's what I'm going to do. You, you made a list of a bunch of things there that for you are undesirable in your perception. Right. Is there one in particular that you look at and you think, oh, I'd really love to stop perceiving that? Um, probably that I am not smart enough. Okay. How does not feeling smart enough actually disrupt your life and the things that you want and the way that you feel? Um, it holds me back. Uh, lots of times I think that, you know, a lot of people are where they are because they have all this knowledge, they, you know, they, they know things, they have the confidence to get out there and do it. And I think that sometimes me thinking that I'm not smart enough holds me back from learning. Um, I love to read and I love to learn. I do love to learn, but I think that that perception is in there and so I think it kind of kind of holds me back there. Yeah, I don't just think it, I know it because you revealed it. <laughs> Our words reveal everything. Okay, for you from the audience, what you've just heard her say, what do you know about this woman with just that 30 second sound bite? What have you learned about her? She lacks confidence. We know that because she says, oh, I, I meet all these different people that have all of this confidence. What is she really saying? I don't have confidence in my choices. We also know that she says, I don't think I'm smart. I meet some people that they seem to know everything that they need to know. What else have you picked up on? She reads, and so she's attempting. So she's putting effort into, it's like, I read books. I'm try I, I think that's how I'm going to get smarter. Like, maybe if I read enough books, I'll, I'll be able to, you know, stamp my piece of paper and put a gold star on it that says, now I'm smart. But the reality is, can you ever read enough books to feel smart? No, reading enough books, and if you tell yourself you're smart, that's pure ego-driven. Smart is a choice. Intelligence is a choice. And the reality is, man, if your life was on the line, you better not ask me to take a chemistry test for you. <laughs> <laughs> but if your life was on the line and, and you needed a standing ovation keynote, put me in coach. Put me in coach. The question isn't whether you're intelligent, it's how are you intelligent? Every one of us intelligent differently. Something happened in your life where you admired someone else's intelligence, a gift they had that you didn't, mm -hmm. and what you determined was that you're not smart. And that's your viper. That's what you look for in your perception. I don't mean viper the car. I mean viper the poisonous snake. Because what it does is it bites you and it puts that toxic poison in your bloodstream and in your perception so that everything gets tainted. Okay. And instead of you walking confidently into the opportunities that will advance your life, the moment you see them, that viper comes out and you, you have to back away, which is going to keep you comfortable are y'all still, are you seeing this? Right, so what we're going to do, for, first of all, I really appreciate the vulnerability, <laughs> okay? Um, in a moment, as I take you through some of these questions, if there's anything you don't feel comfortable sharing, you don't have to, and it will not keep you from your breakthrough. Okay. Are you, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I'm doing is I just wanna make sure that even though you're taking the, this willingness in front of some, <coughs> some people you know, but also a lot of strangers, Mm -hmm. I want you to know that there's a safe place for you, and there's also a really big gift for you being willing to volunteer. Well, I'm comfortable with you, Chris, so right. I'm okay. <laughs> Friends, give her another round of applause. <laughs> this is awesome, Debbie. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I invite you to close your eyes. I invite you to take a deep breath in. I just want to, as you get grounded, I just want to invite you to just let go of your thoughts, the things in your perception. Just, just give me a blank canvas. And here's a question I want to ask, and I want to invite you to trust what comes up. What is the first memory that comes up for you when you have the thought, I'm not smart? Um, it's 
school. Okay, and just let's just guess how old do you think you maybe were? Ish. Um, high school. Okay, in high school, and in this particular moment, what's happening? Um, just having to go to the teacher a lot after school to ask for help. Yeah, so go to your teacher, asking for help, and then something happens where you judge yourself harshly. What happened? Um, it's, they just had to explain a lot of different ways to solve the problem, and I'd finally get it, but yeah. it just seemed like I wasn't getting it at school, in class, and so I'd have to go after to, to finally get it in my brain. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's kind of interesting. My, just stay here with this. My, my daughter comes home from school, and when she feels like she didn't learn something fast enough, she gets sad as if she has this expectation that she should just know what she's learning. Isn't that funny? That we actually, we're, we're there to no learn what we don't know, but because we don't know it, we feed ourselves some really interesting information. Mm -hmm. As you reflect on this time in high school, what did you decide about yourself? when you had that moment where they were showing you and showing you and you weren't getting it, what did you decide about Debbie? That I just, I, I could never seem to get it the first time. I always had to have it explained to me several different times. Yeah. Now let's just think about this. So in that moment, in that moment of uh, maybe emotional trigger and trauma, something gets put in your perception. Your viper is called, I don't get it on the first go around. How does that show up in your life today? A lot. <laughs> and, and just give us a couple of specifics. Like, what are some of the negative consequences that you're getting from this idea that you could experience anything? I mean, you could be walking in the park just to enjoy it, but you actually can't get it the first go around. Because you don't get things on the first go around. For you, it has to be hard, challenging, and a process. How does it show up? Um... It shows up, in, well, you know, I, I think part of it too is that I, I was a stay-at-home mom for my whole life, and so I wasn't in the workforce, and I raised all my kids. I did homeschool for a short time, but it was like um, everybody seemed to be moving forward. It seemed in my mind, um, you know, I was at home raising my children, and, and that's, for me, that was very rewarding, but when I finally had all my children married and went out into the workforce, then it was like I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm behind. I, 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 technology is way ahead of me and all this thing, and I just say, I, I can't learn all this. I don't know how to learn all this. It's just too much. So let me ask you some questions. When you were homeschooling your children and you saw them getting it, did you ever judge yourself? Probably. <laughs> when you went into the wor workforce, we know that you did judge yourself. Oh, yeah. Behind. yeah. When you're with Chris, your husband, and he knows things that you're not getting. Yeah. Right? I, I told him, I says, I, I need you here to help me. Yeah. And now, let's, and now let's actually take a look at the consequences just for a minute. When you do get triggered that you should know something or you should have figured it out by now and you haven't, and all of a sudden you feed yourself this lie, no confidence and I'm not smart, what happens then? How do you feel? Well, I feel discouraged. I feel frustrated. I, I want things, and I'm, I'm not sure I know how to get there. Yeah. So you feel discouraged. That's kind of a negative, hard, you know, harsh energy. Mm -hmm. um, and then what do you do after that? How do you cope with that? I just stay where I am. Okay. Is it working? No. Are you liking it this way? <laughs> no. All right. It's been, a, it's been quite a few years, though, since high school, right? Oh, yes. Okay, so I got the magic envelope, and the results are in. And the results show that your belief that you, that, that your choice back then of choosing that you're not smart, you're not confident, and you don't get it, what are the results? What does it say on the card here? Is it working for you? No. <laughs> so when would be the right time now to actually change this limiting belief? Now. Yeah. Oh, she, Fred, she is so smart. Give it up for her. <laughs> this is the time. 
You totally got that on your first go, all right? This idea that you need multiple iterations, that you're not smart and that you're not confident, if that's not serving, we gotta put something different in your perception that can trump this other one. Okay. So I like to look for a new belief. Let's start with this one that just says, I don't get it on the first go around. Let's trade that for something. Let's upgrade that belief. What could we trade that for? Um. I think deeply about things. I am getting it. What else? I, I like more details. I can, master the situation. I can master the situation. What else? I'm as smart as anyone else. What else? I know the right questions to ask. So you have all these different options. Here's the cool thing. For the first time since high school, we're actually going to upgrade your perception of your intelligence. You were always smart. You were always brilliant in all the ways you needed to be. But what you did is you put a governor on your intelligence overridden with this idea that just says, I don't get it on the first go. So rather than I don't get it on the first go, another possibility might be, I come to understand everything in its perfect timing. Meaning, who cares if it's the first go or the fifth go? Mm -hmm. Does it really matter? No. What, what, what really matters? If it's important, it's important that you eventually what? Get it. Yeah, and, and does it, do we really need to judge how long it takes? No. I, I don't think that really serves. Go ahead, what's yours? Um, my name is Lorene. Hi, Lorene. Right. You need to figure out what your learning style is, and then, then you will know how to obtain that information. Yeah, and, and even above that, I mean, in life as we interact, we're going we're gonna to find some learning styles are useful. We're going to find others aren't. The bottom line is there's just a belief here that skews the perception, and the belief is I don't get stuff. And if, the, if you actually go to a place that says, I understand everything in its perfect time, I understand, I get things, I'm amazing at learning, I'm a voracious student, I'm confident, I'm smart, I'm intelligent, I love how I'm intelligent, I love how I'm gifted, I am gifted. The bottom line is all of that in your perception is going to override because it's consciously placed there. Consciousness always overrides the unconscious. And the, and the unconscious choice will always become, in time, the new unconscious choice. We want to program all of our subconscious with the things that we want instead of don't want. High school, we gave out some powerful programming. I don't get it. I'm not smart, and I'm not confident. And we got the results. It's not working. So we're going to create something totally brand new right now. You ready? Mm -hmm. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to go back to high school. There you are. You're about to meet with your teacher. And you might sense that your teacher's getting a little bit frustrated. And you're starting to question your intelligence. And I want to invite you to show up with this new knowledge that you are perfect the way you are. Your brain functions perfectly for you. That you are deeply intelligent in a number of different ways. And that you understand everything in its perfect timing that you are confident in yourself and how you move forward with your life. And that for you, in your way, you are brilliantly smart. I want to invite you just to soak that up right now. Just breathe that in. And all of a sudden, you look down at what you're trying to learn from the teacher, and Eureka, you got it. You figured it out. Oh my gosh, it just, I gave myself permission to be able to learn this and see it, and I got it in its perfect timing. And I want to invite you to speak these words. I am smart. I am smart. <clears throat> With confidence. <laughs> I am smart. It's not a question. <clears throat> Declare it. I am smart. Five out of ten. I <laughs> I'm just loving on you, Debbie. <laughs> I am smart. Oh, that was a lot better, wasn't it? I like that one. <laughs> All right, try this one out. I'm confident. 
I'm confident. I embrace my intelligence. I embrace my intelligence. I am amazingly intelligent. I'm amazingly intelligent. I'm super gifted. I'm super gifted. And just pause for a minute. Like, school was so long ago, I'm okay not being smart in chemistry. It's really not my gift, but as you look at your life, what actually are your natural gifts and competencies that are useful? When you take everything into account, the arts, and you take you know, dance and music and singing and the ability to love and connect with people and be kind, like all of those are intelligences. As you look at all of them, what are your natural intelligences? I'm a happy person. Awesome. On a, my husband's always telling me, why do you laugh all the time? So anyway, I'm, and, and I'm by a the happy way, person. How many, how many of you wish you were gifted with a little bit more of this <laughs> naturally occurring happiness? <laughs> Crazy awesome gift. Serious, right? And especially for anyone that's depressed out there, you need a little bit more of Debbie Juju. Right? <laughs> now, if we could bottle that and sell it, you'd be, you'd be a millionaire. Okay? <laughs> so it's a big gift. That'd be awesome. <laughs> what's, what, what's another gift? Um, I connect with people well. Yes. I, people like me, I think. Yeah. How many of you have connected with Debbie just between yesterday and today? Just put your hands up. So some of these people here have already been connected. How many of you are <laughs> connecting with her right now? How many of you find that by, by virtue of her vulnerability to stand here, that she is actually a very connected person? Yeah, and friends, that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> because if we could bottle some of your extrovert, gregarious outgoingness, people would buy that, wouldn't you? How many of you here could use an extra dose of outgoingness in your life? Let's take a look. So it, it's a real gift. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can they teach that in school? No. They can't. Can they measure it? No. No, but you can measure what it's like for you when you choose into happy and laughing and being this beautiful, connected human being. These, Debbie, they're your gifts that an SAT will never measure. True. And they are far more valuable than fractions. Okay. How many of you it's think that these know. gifts are more valuable than <laughs> fractions for her? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So let's just try them one more time. I'm smart. I'm smart. I'm smart. I'm smart. I love my life. I love my life. I am confident. I'm confident. I'm kind. I'm kind. I'm connected. I'm connected. I'm outgoing. I'm outgoing. I'm smart. I'm smart. I'm gifted. I'm gifted. And I'm intelligent. And I'm intelligent. Friends, give it up for her. <laughs> yeah. Hey, now friends, what you just saw here can all be reduced to a very simple word, choice. The choices we put into our perception are ultimately going to guide how successful you are in this real estate. It will also guide how successful you are in your relationships. It'll also guide whether you're a happy person or sad person. So you now have a list of the vipers in your life. You have a list of the things that are not working in your perception. And here's a simple tool that I want to give you right, down, right now. Every one of these is based on a limiting belief. Based on a what? And if you want to change your perception, you become the master of becoming conscious of what's limiting and you upgrade it to what is limitless. I want to invite you to spend three days with us at an upcoming Limitless event. Um, I, uh, me and the company, uh, because you are here as clients of ours, we're actually going to be gifting you, each of you, two tickets to either the one next week in March in Salt Lake or to the one in April that will be happening here in Provo. And uh, we're, we're also throwing out um, the VIP upgrade at $99 instead of $149. And Christine, if you could help um, just get those passed out. And if we could also, um, Kellen, make sure that we go ahead and take this form. And actually, for all of those of you online, a link's. Okay, so if you're online, it's already been sent to you. And as you get this order form, if you want to take advantage of these tickets, I want to invite you to have it filled out today and to actually get that back to Christine. And what our team's going to do is we'll go ahead and get you registered for one of those next two events. And here's the invitation. Friends. It is possible to take the undesirables in your perception and to purge them. So go ahead and just put your paper down for a second. I want to invite everyone to stand up with me right now. Go ahead and stand up. If you are in your home, I want to invite you to stand up. 
come and join us right here, at least energetically here in the connection that we have here for this little bit of time before I wrap this up. And I want to invite you to try on some new things. I'm going to have you repeat these words. I'm in charge of my perception. I'm in charge of my perception. I'm 100% responsible for my perception. Anything undesirable, I can purge. I get rid of what doesn't work. I put it on trial. I judge it. If it doesn't serve, I eliminate it by the power of choice. All right, give yourselves a big round of applause. Go ahead and have a seat. And uh, take a moment right now uh, when we go on break here in a minute to fill that out, you can get that turned back into Christine Graham. On the back side of your form is where you have a chance to get that discounted VIP. Um, right now, these events, they, they get fairly large. And so if you do get a chance to sit in the VIP session, it gets you really up close and personal, a lot of great interaction. And then there are some really great bonus sessions. One of the bonus sessions that I do at the event, um, these bonus sessions happen before the day starts at nine o'clock on the second and third day. And so, for example, on the second day, we meet at 8.15. And what we're going to do is I will actually give you five of my top belief breakthrough scripts. If you follow these scripts, they will help you find all the pythons and vipers and poisonous snakes in your perception. And it will teach you one at a time how to yank those out so that you can start constructing a perception that is purged from all undesirables and will actually enable you to start perceiving the things that you want instead of the things that you don't want. How many of you would love to own that skill and have a tool to be able to do that? Would that be powerful and useful? Mm -hmm. Well, my invitation is for you to make the choice to come to this three-day event next month or month after. We have a couple of people here that have actually been to the event. Um, I don't think very many of us, but I'd like to just ask for a couple of people to share what their experience was at being at the event. Do I have a couple people that are willing to share their limitless experience? Um, when I first went to Limitless in October, um, I came with a friend of mine who happens to be a better friend of yours. And watching her go through so much that was triggered for her that weekend actually triggered some things for me, which were more similar than I would have liked to admit. And by the end of the weekend, she had made such incredible improvement. And I was able to look at that and, and apply it to myself. And um, on the way home, we talked and she helped me overcome completely a major block that had happened. And it was because of the Limitless weekend. It was because of the breakthroughs that had gone on and the transitions that we both had to go through. Beautiful. Guys, let's give it up for Rochelle. Thank you. What's that? Rachel. Let's just get one, maybe another one. S someone else willing to share their Limitless experience? Do you mind coming up here? Yeah, yeah come on up here. <laughs> okay, I just have one thing to say. Well, I have probably a few. Oh, All right. <laughs> you, you now have the microphone. So um, for 25 years, my husband and I have been challenging our limiting beliefs. Um, for many of those years, it's been almost daily. And it has been a, an incredible but very, very challenging way to approach life. Um, but it was when we went to Limitless at Vaughn's invitation that all of a sudden our last month has been so exponentially challenging that we can hardly keep our feet on the ground. We are so challenged after Limitless in, try, in, in understanding things that we have been trying to break through forever, and we have been very diligent in challenging those beliefs, but Limitless propelled us into a world that we were, we've just been tailspinning ever since, trying to comprehend all that our minds are sharing with us and helping us overcome that. But um, oh, uh, Limitless opened that up for us. And it's almost been too hard 
it's almost been too hard, but we're doing it. And I am just thrilled that we, that Limitless was able to do that for us and, and get us to that point because we certainly needed to a breakthrough and a lot of breakthroughs. And we've been achieving those. Some of the things that I have been working to comprehend limiting beliefs in my life, I'm finally, finally getting there. And I'm just thrilled and I just think Limitless is great. So there you go. Oh, friends, thank you so much. Let's give it up for her. Thank you. Let's get one more. I just want to share. Um, I have actually an opposite belief that it is easy. And um, I've had the privilege of working with Chris for a couple of years. And uh, I just want to share just very briefly. I'm working with a man right now who has been plagued with migraines and um, met with him for the second time yesterday. And he told me that after our first time that we met, he has not had one migraine since then. And um, I have, have a belief that it is easy to change these limiting beliefs and that it can be, it can be mind altering, it can change your whole perception, it can change your world, it can change your finances, it can change health, and that if we just believe that it's easy, it will be. Let's give it up for Wileen, thank you. Ultimately, friends, our perception drives our reality. Our perception what? Drives our reality. And so if you want to change your reality, you have to change your what? Perception. perception. So you've been given some tools today. I invite you to come register for the event next week in Salt Lake City or for the one coming up in April. You have two free tickets on behalf of us as the company to just let you know that we appreciate you. We want to invest deeper into you. We want to assist you with having the breakthroughs that will allow you to move forward because many of you here, how many of you want to do more real estate? You got to create permission in your perception to make that possible. And that three-day event will help you like this event on that journey of making that more possible. Thank you so much for being with me today and for giving me an opportunity, Ken. And looking forward to seeing all of you building your portfolios bigger this year than ever before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.